Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. During the cold weather months, a growing number of dairy farmers in Vermont and the country are using a housing system for their animals called a bedded pack barn. Compared to traditional stall barns, bedded packs provide animals with room to roam or relax and they provide environmental benefits. Across the fences, Keith Silva tells us more. On a cold, bright winter's day, the cows at Swallowdale Farm in Orwell are ready to pack it in. This is our bedded pack. It's just like being on a feather bed. From about November through April, these cows eat, sleep, and chill out in comfort on this bedded pack, sometimes called a loafing barn or a covered barnyard. It's a way farmers bring the outside inside. Everything we do from the time that we bring the cows in off a of pasture until we put them back out is really just a compromise. We're trying to duplicate the pasture environment as nearly as we can. There's all kinds of issues, all kinds of compromises, and this is the closest we've been able to come to duplicating that without moving south. By letting the cows hang out and do what they do do, this pack becomes a nutrient management tool and serves as a fertilizer source. It's a combination of uh, housing cows comfortably in the wintertime and storing manure, uh, adding carbon to the manure so that we can compost it and stabilize it for uh, future fertilization purposes. And then when it does end up being applied to the field, we hope that it's done in a timely fashion and um, very stable fertilizer that uh, promotes biological activity in the soil and um, just does good things. When winter ends and the growing season begins, the pack goes from looking like this to this. Mark and his wife Sarah have been farming all their lives. When they bought this farm, they knew from experience that it would come with its own set of challenges. We moved here eight years ago from a rented farm, came to these really very different facilities, and um, it took us a year really to understand the farm. We had a whole set of ideas of what we want to do, what we want to change before we got here. But after we were here for, for a year, we did change some of those ideas, and we were glad that we didn't do everything immediately. And uh, definitely the bedded pack was one of those things. I don't think we didn't come here thinking that we were going to put the bedded pack in. And we thought we were going to have a free stall because that's what was here. The Russells were faced with a choice, renovate the free stall barn or come up with a different idea. We tore the free stalls out and we were not committed to running a pack indefinitely. We can still add our freestyles back in. We can pour the concrete, put the steel in. The point is you're not married to it necessarily just because you've cleared out the barn and run the pack. I mean, you can experiment with it and say, I'm never doing that again. And you can put your stalls yeah. in. Russell estimates that it would have cost him close to $100,000 to make the necessary repairs to put in a new freestall barn. As it stands today, Putting in this bedded pack has cost him much less. It costs roughly $52 a day in bedding. It takes me 45 minutes to an hour to bed them a day. Compared to renovating the freestyle and replacing the freestyles, um, really there's zero cost. The Russell's low cost approach is due in large part because they had an existing structure that they could use for their bedded pack. Other farmers have had to invest a lot more money or take part in government cost share programs in order to build structures to house their bedded packs. Over time, I've seen that it cost me about $10,000 from beginning to end to maintain and manage this type of system. That $10,000 you do need to figure um, every year but if you look at the building, I think over time, the building itself isn't going to cost me much. But the, at least whatever I spend on the inside, I feel is a better return for me as a farmer because it all goes back to the soil. Because all the manure gets composted before it goes back on the soil, 
farmers using bedded packs spend less on fertilizer, and there is very little nutrient runoff that ends up in waterways. The environmental benefits alone are reason enough for farmers to consider this type of system. It can take a huge investment if you have to build a structure for it. The biggest challenge though is finding a source of available bedding. You don't want to be trying to do this and then run out of bedding midstream. And you have to be ready to be flexible if you don't have your bedding source on your own farm, if you're getting it from off the farm. You have to understand that you might be using different bedding from year to year or you might be switching in the middle of the season and be ready for that. Herd size can be a determining factor in the feasibility of establishing a bedded pack. Each situation is different, but all management plans begin the same way. Like any decision you're going to make, you need to sit down with a pencil, and that's going to be the first tool you use to do a bedded pack. Bedded packs benefit the environment. In addition, farmers say that healthier cows are happier cows. The feet and legs are stellar um, when they're on the pack. They're not on the concrete. Concrete is hard on feet and legs. It's just no, no bones about it. So the less time they spend on the concrete, the better. I don't mean any disrespect to the well-managed freestyles around the neighborhood. Uh, there's some very comfortable cows out there. We have zero uh, leg problems associated with stall barns. Um, no swollen hocks, uh, very, very little foot trouble. When you walk in, and, uh, in a, on a winter afternoon and those cows are all loafing on that pack, they're laying down, chewing their cud, and they're so comfortable. Other than actually being out to pasture, the bedded pack can't be beat. At Swallowdale Farm, as long as the bed's made and the cows are comfortable, it's okay to leave the barn door open and let a little of the outside in. In Orwell, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. Of course, once the cows are milked, the milk is sent off for processing and may be turned into products like cheese, butter, or yogurt. And that's where food tasting and food research come into play. For more on that, here's Rebecca Gollin at the University of Vermont. How food tastes is well, a matter of taste. I like thicker yogurt, so the thinner ones, you could tell right away that, I mean, I knew I wasn't gonna like them as much. For these University of Vermont students, how food tastes is the topic, and there's a lot to learn. So fruity, usually in cheese we say, is a negative descriptor. Look at the food, uh, try to describe the appearance, uh, color, if it has a texture or just you know some appealing um, properties to you or some defects sometimes and then um, try to you know have a little bite or a little you know sip if it's a liquid and um, feel the, the taste the texture the mouth feeling and then the aftertaste and again try to describe what you feel we had to know the feel like between your fingers versus the feel between your back teeth and the smell of it on the outside, the smell of it on the inside, the overall appearance, um, whether or not there were crystals in it, um, the flavor, the taste, it was just, it was a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. I think a lot of it is learning to smell food and also taste it because you kind of, if you smell it first, you learn that it either has the same smell or a different smell than the food. We noticed it especially with the cheese. A lot of it has a very strong, kind of uh, displeasing smell, but then once you taste it, it actually tastes good. Engaging multiple senses is definitely encouraged in this class. In sensory evaluation of foods, we're learning about how companies and producers um, go about getting their foods tested by either professionals who have been trained um, in evaluating foods or consumers have their likeness or dislike of products and basically the whole process that goes into taking a product from beginning to um, store shelves. You want to study a product, which one? Before it was cheddar, now it's fresh mozzarella. 
So you need to what? Collect a lot of samples within this variety of product. The goal is to learn how to evaluate food um, from liquid to solid to you know, coffee to cheese, uh, different products, and to learn the basic sensory tests. To learn those basics takes some time. Well, before the evaluation uh, of the food per se, we do some training exercise, quite boring, uh, very basic uh, exercise to uh, identify basic taste, because some people think, they, oh yes, I know the taste, of course, but they are very confused, imagine, about bitterness and acidity. It was a really long process. We had to do, for each of the five tastes, we had to taste uh, 10 samples of varying I guess densities, like how much, or concentrations. And um, from there we judge like, oh, how salty is this? And you could tell some people in the class were very susceptible to salt, while others couldn't taste it at all until you got to where it was almost all salt. But that's how you kind of get the basic idea of what each of the tastes are and where you, where you are on that scale. On this day, the students are evaluating drinkable yogurt. We sampled some plain yogurt and some strawberry yogurts. Um, there was four of them, and we just tried them and kind of rated them which one we liked the best and which one we liked the least. We're just doing a consumer test, so it's our the yogurt's likability to the consumers. So we're just, we don't know what the yogurts are, and we just sort of rank them on a scale of one to nine for taste and mouthfeel and overall acceptance. Not knowing which yogurt is which is important because alongside the consumer products is one that's being developed right here at UVM. And it's yogurt with a twist. Researchers are experimenting with adding carbonation to it. This is the carbonator stone and the CO2 goes through here and is pushed out of um, the little pores in a way that um, the CO2 goes into the mixture homogeneously. So there are little bubbles throughout all of the yogurt, not just certain parts of it. The yogurt is being produced here in the Functional Foods Research Lab, where UVM scientists are working to make healthy food even better. The major function of a food is for nutrition and energy. That's, that's the major functions of food we eat. Uh, but the functional foods is beyond nutrition. So any food we eat uh, not only give us nutrition but also may have health benefits. Those foods are referred to functional foods. Um, like the foods can help us to prevent certain kind of chronic diseases, keep us healthy. In the yogurt base there's the milk the added protein and the inulin, which is a prebiotic. And then there's the syrup, which is pectin and sugar. Functional foods are not always developed in a lab. The term can apply to any food that has a positive effect on health beyond just nutrition, such as blueberries, tomatoes, or broccoli, which have antioxidant and cancer-fighting properties. What Dr. Guo and his team are focused on is adding beneficial properties to milk, soy, and oat-based products. 70% of the, the diseases we have are preventable. For Guo, providing healthier choices is a start, but what he would really like to develop is a product that will appeal to consumers enough to compete with the mainstream. Adding carbonation to their drinkable yogurt is one possibility. The consumption of carbonated or soda. This country, we drink more than 40 gallons of soda on average, each year, each person. The, the drinkable, carbonated drinkable yogurt yeah, we are yeah. making or we develop has the nutrition of milk, the functional ingredients of yogurt, and then give people uh, the, the sensation feeling of carbon dioxide. Feedback from the class will provide valuable information for the researchers as they continue to refine their yogurt. Guo has high hopes. So I think the functional foods will be the foods for the future. Until that future gets here, the best bet is to try to stay healthy the old-fashioned way. Eat the variety of foods, eat the colorful foods, um, eat the natural foods, whole foods, 
and anything in moderation and same time exercise I think we should be uh, good creating better food in hopes of better health the functional foods lab at UVM is working on their recipe in Burlington I'm Rebecca Gullen with Across the Fence. Well, thank you, Rebecca, and thank you for joining us. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence. For a video copy of today's program, call toll-free 1-888-ATF-3430. Across the Fence is brought to you as a public service by University of Vermont Extension and WCAX-TV.